Praise God. I am so thankful for you and so thankful for this time together. My friend, you, you really matter. And in this time, this difficult time in this world's history, I just really believe even as you've been meditating and enjoying the worship and the time of praise and God's presence, right now, some of you are like Stephen. Pastor Stephen, I've got to give my life to Jesus now. I can't wait till the end of the message. We need to pray a prayer right now. Well, you know what? I agree with you. Let's us pray together. I just really believe that God wants to do something supernatural through you and me as we come before Him and repent and just humble ourselves. So pray this prayer with me right now. Dear Lord Jesus, forgive us for we have sinned. We need a Savior. You are the only one who has died on a cross for us rose up from the grave. Come into our heart, Jesus. Be the Lord of our life. Help us to obey you, to walk in love. Now we are children of God. In your name, Jesus, we pray this. Amen. Wow. What a great way to start this message. What a great way to start your day. I'm so excited. God's working in our lives. And you know what? Father God always honors a prayer of repentance. He meets you right where you're at. Isn't that so good? We're going to continue our series called Get Help, Give Help. Holy Spirit, help us with this. We need your help to breathe on the Word of God. And I've got a special helper here for part four, my little beautiful wife, Miss Pam. You're going to help me. I'm so excited. We're going to get practical today with this message, Get Help, Give Help. We've learned so much so far. Pam, have you been learning anything? I have, that (laughs) we need to get help. And there's a proper way to do that. And then it's the law of reciprocity, like you said. We need to then give help. So good, Pam. Everybody needs to get help and everybody needs to give help. That's what we were designed for. Matthew 7, 7, Jesus said this, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened unto you. That's a pretty good promise, isn't it? It is, yeah. I love it. (laughs) So we learn from the widow of Zarephath. Here's what we learn from her, that getting help can be triggered by giving what you have. Remember, she had so little, but even her last little piece of bread that she was saving for her and her little dying son, but she gave it to the prophet. And in giving help, she triggered God giving help to her life. We learn from Ruth the Moabite. I love that woman. She is a foreigner, but we learn from her how to ask, seek, pursue, obey, how to be honorable in a very dishonorable environment. And in her giving, she became royalty. She went from being this lost little precious Moabite woman on the outside looking in to becoming a princess. And ultimately, she became an ancestor of King Jesus. I love it because she's kind of like the the Wonder Woman movies. She's very kind and nurturing, but very strong and unmovable and not easily offended. (laughs) You know what? I I think you're right. I think if we could get a picture of Ruth the Moabitess, she looked a lot like Wonder Woman. I agree with you. (laughs) And then we learn from Jesus that even he, King Jesus, had to be in a certain place asking, seeking, and even Jesus had to increase in favor with God and with man, had to increase in wisdom. So if Jesus had to do it, it tells me, Stephen, you've got to increase in wisdom and in favor with God and with man. And that requires humility. So let's back up on our little acronym for H-E-L-P, for help. Remember, H, you got to what, Pam? Have. You got to have. You got to be a haver. You got to be a haver. (laughs) You know, take inventory. What do you have? E for? Express. You got to express the need honestly. Ask the questions to the right people. And you got to be able to express thanksgiving too. You know, Philippians 4 says that we're supposed to make our petitions, specific requests with thanksgiving. Very important. L for? Lead. You got to identify the lead. Jesus said, did you not know, mom and dad, I had to be in my father's house, sourcing out wisdom from the people that had the wisdom, right? And then P for? 
pursue. Man, you got this down. You've been studying. <laughs> pursue. Yeah. You got to ask and keep on asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, keep giving, keep expecting, but you've got to pursue. There's got to be some tenacity so, to what you're doing. So let's get practical here um, with my little guest helper and speaker today, Miss Pamela. You know, Pam, I remember talking about getting help. I remember me being, when we first moved to Nashville, I remember one weekend you were on the road. And so I was home in the studio working. And I remember I was desperately needing help because I was in my pajamas. Oh, yeah. Um, do you I remember the story? Yeah. Say, yeah. And I, I went to the basement door. Now, somehow we put the lock on there so that it would lock from in the house. But it from the basement, it it seemed like it would lock but you couldn't get through when you're, once it was locked from the basement back into the house. Yeah. So I went down there, emptied the dehumidifier or something like that, went back upstairs and was like, oh my goodness, I closed the door. So there I am in my pajamas, my pajamas and long hair. It's raining cats and dogs outside and the door's locked. And I'm, I'm thinking, there's got to be a way. There was no way. No. So then I thought, you know, our friend down the street, Tammy, she usually had a key. So I thought, I'll go down there. So I, there I am in the pouring rain, walking down the street to her place, <laughs> getting sopped and wet. Picture it, everybody. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm go in the house. <laughs> Um, couldn't find the key, nothing. So I go back to our place. I'm back in the basement and I'm thinking, what am I going to do? So we had this old beat up ladder, rusty ladder that barely reached the bottom of the deck in the back. So there was no stairs yeah. because somebody had eliminated the stairs to the yeah, deck. We won't talk about that. <laughs> we won't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> so I climbed up, got on the banister, the ban crawled over the banister, soaking wet, long hair, all wet. There was bird poop all over the thing. I had it all down the front of me. It was a terrible mess. Then I had to pull the ladder up and get up on the second floor, crawl through a window. And the next thing you know, the, the alarm went off. Oh, yeah. Somehow the alarm got triggered. Did the police come? Forgot. Uh, the police came, oh, no. but I mean, the thing is, and I was in my pajamas, soaking wet. It was, you know, it was quite an explanation trying to explain So that. you needed help. So the long story <laughs> is, yes, I needed H-E-L-P. Sometimes we all need help. You know, Pam, we've had a few people reach out to us with a variety of questions or requests to get help. And I think this is going to be really good for us just to go for them, go through them and practically give out how that, you know, the process of getting help. You know, I want to start by an example of somebody who's a great testimony at our church that just recently, a few weeks ago, a student from university reached out to us in a crisis. She was counting on a very specific internship that she was promised and it fell through. And she was feeling so alone. She's an international student. She has no family here. She reached out to us and she was feeling everything like her dreams, everything she'd prayed for, everything was about to vanish in front of her. She was pretty frantic. Mm -hmm. And so here's what she did. She worked the H she had. She had faith in God and she had us, her church family. She worked the E. She expressed a desire for contact, for prayer, for encouragement. Then guess what she did? She identified the, the L. She identified the lead, asked church leaders. She asked God, who is her father, to help her and to direct her. And then she worked the P for pursue. She didn't just cry about her loss of opportunity. She humbled herself, reached out, and she confessed that she just wasn't strong enough on her own. And guess what, Pam? She got Such the a good story. She got the answer. <laughs> God answered her heart's desire by giving her a replacement internship. She got placement that was coordinated perfectly Yay. with her education, her dreams, her family's rejoicing. She's rejoicing. And we are too because we love seeing people get H-E-L-P. Yes. God is Help. a God of answers. Man, Pam, she pulled a Ruth. She did. She, she was, pulled a Jesus. She was strong, tender. She went to the right place and God answered her. All right, Pammy. Give us our first question or request. Angela asks, how can we walk in victory over fear? Victory over fear. That is a great question. And um, let me give you the short answer. You need to binge watch our series that we did a few months back called No Fear Here. We really get into the deep end talking about 1 John 4, 18 that says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment. 
but he or she who fears has not been made perfect in love. Now, what that means is it's not a condemnation that you're not perfect because you don't love enough. It means that you have more capacity for love. If you're still struggling with fear, that means there's more capacity. You, you have great capacity being made in the image of God. And that means you have more room for God's love in your heart. And love is very weaponized against fear. I love, we started a kids group uh, a few years ago called, and then and their CD cover, their CD, the, the name of the whole production was called Yes to Love, No to Fear. And I think we have to get it right. We can't say no to fear without saying yes to love first. Because when we say yes to love, Love itself ushers fear out the door, right? That's good. Yeah. That's good. We need to understand this, that fear is the enemy's choice weapon. But love is God's unfailing weapon. Faith is a shield. Remember, faith is defensive, That's but good. love, love is the word of God. Remember, Jesus said this in John 1, 1. He said that he said, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. And we know from 1 John 4 that God is love. So Love is very weaponized and offensive, and it goes after the throat of fear, and it rips it out every time. So engage in God's word and getting filled with his love. Use the sword of the spirit. But my dear friends, you cannot overcome thoughts with thoughts. That's a big mistake a lot of Christians make, trying to overcome fearful, anxious thoughts with thoughts. You have to open up your mouth Profess, speak, sing, confess your faith. Men tend to be the worst at this. They stew in their worry and their fear. <laughs> but you must speak out your faith. God's word is activated by you speaking, singing, praying the word of God. So open up your mouth, even if it's quiet. I've done the same thing. Mm -hmm. I won't get into the details, but I've done the same thing when I've been uh, traumatized by fear and anxiety. I've just opened up my mouth and just said, in the name of Jesus, yes. welcome Holy Spirit. Yeah. Just speak life. Even if it's just to say no to the fear and like Bam said the song, no, fear, go in Jesus' name. And you know, I, I think it's important sometimes I'll be like this and you'll see the look on my face and you'll say, what's going on? The thoughts are loud in my uh, mind and you say, you gotta say something. So I was talking to a friend the other day, the, the, her mind was just overtaking her with depression. But she said something. Yeah. All right. What's the next question, Pammy? Hi, Pastor Stephen. My name is Ashley, and I am often in meetings with students and colleagues where I see an opportunity to spread the gospel, but I'm too shy to do it. Same with my family and friends. Can you help me? That is such a good question, Ashley. Listen. Now, part of help for this situation will be the same as what we gave to walking in victory over fear. Perfect love, remember this, cast down all fear. Being shy, nervous, timid to do something is actually rooted in fear. Could be the fear of rejection, the fear of man, the fear of failure, maybe a little bit of a concert of all of those things. And I know this, I know all about it because Pam, when I was a boy, I struggled with being shy most of my life. Every time I'd walk on stage, I remember this as an adult, I'd have an argument with God backstage as they're introducing me going, God, I, I still think you picked the wrong guy. I should be alone somewhere on an island, quietly, with nobody around, just struggling with fear and, and being shy. But look what God did, because you put your trust in Him. Well, here's how I handled my shyness and my timidity. I began countering it with God's Word about me. you got to say what God says about you. Proverbs 28.1 says this, The righteous are as bold as a lion. Now you might say, well, I don't think I'm very righteous. Well, here's what it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So if Jesus is righteous and you know he is and he lives in you, then you are the righteousness of God. Therefore, you can have legal right to say the righteous are as bold as a lion. I'm the righteousness of God. So every time I feel shy, nervous, even scared, I use it as a trigger to remind me to say what God's word says about me. Hey, I'm as bold as a lion. That's what I say. God says that about me. So I say it about me. I even wrote it on a sticky note and put it around the window where I was working just to remind me. And you know, the apostles prayed for boldness. 
Acts 4, verse 29, the apostles prayed this. They said, grant to your servants that with all boldness, we may speak your word. And here's the other bit of H-E-L-P that I'd like to give you in this area. Focus on living Christ so that your life preaches. Christ without even using words. It's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. People want what you have if what you have is better. St. Francis reportedly said this, preach Jesus and if necessary, use words. I love that. And here's what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 5, verse 16. He said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your moral excellence and your praiseworthy, noble and good deeds and recognize and honor and praise and glorify your father in heaven. Remember the woman at the well in John 4? She became like the modern day Billy Graham, Pam. She was winning her whole city to Jesus. And when Christ lives in you, it shows up in your words and in your deeds. People recognize when you're critical or sarcastic or a, a pot stirrer. Or you're, they also recognize if you're kind, forgiving, quick to be thankful and give understanding. So let's let your light shine. That's how you do it. And we're, we're supposed to be the fragrance of Jesus to the world, not stinky stuff. We're supposed to be the fragrance of Jesus <laughs> oh, to the world. I don't want to be stinky. I don't want to be stinky. Jesus help me. <laughs> <laughs> we have another question from Dawson. I am having a hard time forgiving people. What can I do about that? Man, Dawson, you just put your finger on a problem that plagues the world. And sadly, it plagues too many good church-going people. Unforgiveness stops God's power. I know that's just very simple what I just said, but let me say it again. Unforgiveness stops God's power. And my friend, you cannot pray around unforgiveness. It has to be dealt with. You know, you could pray three hours and go, oh, nothing's happening. Maybe I need to jack it up to eight hours. Stop. You need to walk in forgiveness. If you have unforgiveness in your life, you're, you're, Prayers are shut off, your praise is shut off, your worship, your giving, everything you're doing unto God has become an abomination to God. You have to get the forgiveness in place. First of all, you've got to realize that everything manifests in your life. It starts on the inside of you and in the invisible place of your heart. Seeds grow in the dark, whether they're good or bad. Jesus said this in Matthew 12, verses 35 and 36. He said, the good man from his inner good treasure flings forth good things, and the evil man out of his evil storehouse flings forth evil things. But Jesus said, I tell you, on the day of judgment, men will have to give account for their idle, inoperative, non-working word they speak. Now, here's what he meant, Pam. You're praying prayers but they're inoperative. Mm -hmm. Nothing's happening. You're going to have to give account for speaking words, authorizing good things, but nothing good happening. Well, why did that happen? Unforgiveness. Yeah. You had a seed of unforgiveness in your heart and it manifested in a full stopping of God's power. Wow. You can't afford that. So let's deal with the problem right now and let's get the power back on. How do we do that? Let's use our H-E-L-P. First, you got to H, you got to have. Take honest inventory of your hurts, where you've been hurt, but also take inventory that you have Jesus the Savior. Has he forgiven you? Yes, he has. Have you sinned? Yes, you did. But receive his forgiveness and now have that power, the power of forgiveness. Now E for express. Express your need for mercy and forgiveness. And now with Jesus' help, express. Choose to express forgiveness for others. Just say out loud, I forgive that person of this or that. Don't stand up in the middle of the church and do it. No, privately, secretly, in your car, at home, pray, Lord, I forgive that person. I can do this. You don't need to feel it. See, too often Christians think they got to feel forgiveness for it to be a reality. You don't need to feel it. You just need to authorize it right. with your words. Your words are licensed. Express forgiveness. L, lead you got to identify the lead, right? So unforgiveness used to lead your heart. You see, unforgiveness can lead your life. 
You got to identify that wrong lead, that demonic lead, and you got to knock them down with allowing Jesus, the Savior, to lead your heart. Jesus is your example, your champion of mercy and forgiveness. Allow him to be your leader, your example. And then P, pursue. Posture yourself to stay in a perpetual state of pursuing your lead, not unforgiveness, Right? You got to go to Jesus every day. Renew your mind with his word. He is your chief mentor and you ask him, who else should I pursue for expertise in this area? Lord, who do you want me to have as a mentor and advisor? Because you see, if you pursue the wrong leaders, then you'll probably end up dealing with major hurts, offenses, and more problems again. Nobody can offend you like the wrong mentors that God never assigned you to have. Stop that and pursue the direction of your chief captain, champion mentor, Jesus. And the Holy Spirit will declare, disclose, and transmit the will of the Father. I love it. Yeah. There's another question. Ruth says, hi, Pastor Stephen. Hi, Ruth. <laughs> Why do people enjoy stirring up dissension and putting other people down? What does God say about that? Well, let's keep this short. Proverbs 4, verse 16 for the wicked cannot sleep unless they do evil, and they are deprived of sleep unless they make someone stumble and fall. I don't think it's natural for people to like stirring up trouble or hurting others. I, I kind of think of it as an unhealthy habit like mm, drug addiction or smoking. You know, a person's body naturally rejects the habit of cigar cigarette smoking when they first start, but if you do it enough, you kind of break this curve and now suddenly the thing that your body was rejecting, now it begins to crave. You can teach your body to crave what it doesn't really want. There are people who've been hurt, they've been abused, and when the hurt goes unhealed long enough, Pam, it becomes a well. It becomes like this dark source that people can draw on to hurt other people. You know, there's a saying, and, and I kind of hate it, but it's true, hurt people hurt people. You've got to get the hurts resolved. And unfortunately, there's a, there's a bad outcome for cursing other people. So let me give you a key to life that, that you'll never regret if you never forget. Okay? <laughs> let me give you a key to life that you'll never regret if you never forget. Walk in forgiveness. Don't stir up dissension. Proverbs 6 says one of the things that God hates is feet that run swift to mischief and sowing discord among the brethren. So you'll never regret if you never forget that. Here's a video question from a young man named Ooh. Alex. I like it. My dad is my homeschool teacher now. Pastor, help me. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> I love that little guy. He's amazing. You know what? I, I can't help it. We got to play it one more time. One more time. And I don't know if the guys can. Can you put some kind of funny little music with it? That was awesome. Okay. Here we go. My dad is my homeschool teacher now. Pastor, help me. <laughs> I love it. That's awesome. What a cute little guy. He's awesome. So his dad's basically his homeschool teacher right now, and he's like, Pastor, you gotta help me, right? <laughs> okay, Alex, listen, you are one awesome, funny dude, and here's what I would say to you to give you a little bit of help. Remember, help is spelled how? H-E-L-P, right? So do this first. H, you gotta have. Be thankful you got a daddy. Be thankful that you even got schoolwork because the fact that you've got schoolwork actually means that you're important. That's why you've got schoolwork. And that you have a daddy. Man, when I was growing up, I didn't have a dad. So you are so blessed to have a good dad that wants to help you with your schoolwork. Now, E, express that thanks. That means say it out loud. Alex, you gotta express your thanksgiving. You can't just be thankful in your heart. That's important, but you gotta say out loud, 
Dad, I'm thankful for you. And then maybe get your dad to help you guys to pray together and ask for more help from God who wants another teacher to come in and help you. Maybe if your dad's struggling with math or something, you can pray for another teacher. And L for lead. What that means is God will bless you, Alex. He will bless you when you remember that your dad is the lead of your home. God has assigned your dad to be the leader of your home. And so when you pray for your dad being the leader, a blessing, more blessing comes on you. Isn't that cool? And then P for pursue. Alex, let me tell you something. Just you getting this awesome video to me tells me that you're the kind of guy that's going to ask and keep on asking, knock and keep on knocking, seek and keep on seeking. You're that kind of guy. Listen, you are modeling it for us adults. We need to be learning from you. So thank you so much for your question. Love you, little Alex. <laughs> We have another um, video question from Lenora. Okay. Hi, Pastor Stephen. My name's Lenore, and I read my Bible regularly, but I'm wondering, how could I be studying it more academically? Well, this is exciting. This is an exciting get help question, Lenora, and I don't get asked this every day, so thank you so much. To answer your questions, here is where I'd start. This may seem a little bit unusual, but follow me here. Try working backwards from the ultimate outcome that you're seeking. What is it you really want in pursuing the, um, the academic deep dive into the Word of God? Do you want to go into the ministry? Is that what you really want? You want to be a professional minister? If so, um, where do you want to specialize? Do you want to be maybe a Christian writer or an author or maybe a journalist? The reason I'm directing you to really be honest with yourself about the outcome of your desire is because I find too many people triangulate. They want C, but they're saying they want B because in their mind they're thinking mathematically, if I get B, then I can get C. So you really need to be honest with your desires of what is the outcome, where you want to be. Because too many young people, they, they would ask a question like that, and right away a pastor or a minister would direct them, oh, you need to go to Bible college. If Bible college is not God's plan for your life, it's the worst place for you to be. Listen to 2 Timothy 2.15. Study and be eager to do your utmost to present yourself to God approved, a workman who has no cause to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The reason it says there, Paul's letter to Timothy, rightly dividing the word of truth was because there was so much wrong dividing of God's word. And when you pull God's word out of context and you lose the spirit of God's word, that's where the enemy comes in. Remember, the enemy tempted Jesus in the wilderness with the word of God. The Pharisees and the Sadducees accused Jesus and attacked Jesus with what? The Word of God. The, crazy how that can happen. So here's my answer on studying God's Word more academically. H, have. Take inventory of what you have. Your real desire for outcome here. What's your real desire? That's what you have. E, express. Articulate your desire for an academic deep dive so that you can be what? So that you can be where? You, you've got to express that. Put it out loud, even with your mentors and your advisors, so that everybody can help you pray this through. Then L for lead. Let God help you, obviously, first and foremost, identify your, your passion, your desire, where he's designed you to be, because he is the author and finisher of your faith, after all. And so as you identify God as the lead and then the right mentors in your life, he may add to you maybe a Hebrew scholar, maybe it's a pastor, maybe a professor. You know, who knows who God will bring into your life to help you further um, narrow down where God's called you to because God's a God of focus. He's called you to a focus. And then P, finally, pursue. Just like you've done today, keep asking. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep pursuing because it'll be layer upon layer upon layer and God will bring you out to an awesome, awesome outcome. You know, we have um, Bible studies. We have on our lifetalkspodcast.com. You can go and you can go through all the books, some of the Bible. One is Proverbs, where we unfold, go down each chapter, and we unfold in Hebrew and Greek what it means. It's great. You might want to join us there. But I love the scripture in the Bible where it says, sense and reason 
without the Holy Spirit is lifeless. So always invite the Holy Spirit, right? All right, Pam, what else do we have? Amanda wrote in, I am hurt and disappointed by my fellow Christians. So how do I go forward? Mm -hmm. Yes, this is such a great, great question, Amanda. And here is the temptation in our present culture to be so distracted by what you cannot control that you don't master what you can control. It's the enemy's tactic. Remember, he's a, he's a strategist that loves to divide and conquer. When you're focused on what you cannot control or are not assigned to control, you feel out of control, scared. When you laser focus on what God has called you to control, to have dominion over, he gives you grace and peace and his anointing kicks in. Pam, like when I'm doing something that God hasn't called me to do, I've got no anointing and the lifting is heavy. It's discouraging. It's frustrating. And trust me, I've done it many times. That's why, you know, I've learned I do what God's called me to do. This is what Jesus said. He told everybody, he said, I only do what the Father tells me to do. I only say what the Father tells me to say. John 16, verse 33. This scripture should really bring um, comfort to you, Amanda. I've told you these things, Jesus said, so that in me you may have perfect peace and confidence. In the world you have tribulation and trials and distress and frustration, but be of good cheer. Take courage. I have overcome the world. Jesus conquers the world, not us. God fights our battles, not us. Jesus builds the church, not us. God does the redeeming. God does the restoring. God does the repaying. Let God carry the responsibility of being God. Even though things may look crazy, God is excellent at being God. He knows what he's doing. Here's what we need to focus on. The Bible says that we need to set our mind on things above. We do that. We do unto others as we have them do to us. That's what we do. That's our assignment. We forgive others as we would have God forgive us. That's what we do. We humble ourselves, not other people. Look, I can't humble Pam. My responsibility is to humble myself, right? We choose Christ. I can't choose Christ for Pam. That Pam has to authorize that. We choose Christ for ourselves. We choose life. We choose blessing and not cursing. We do that for us. We're the ones with the authority over the realm of our being. People will disappoint you. My friend, people disappointed Jesus. They betrayed Jesus. But hold fast to the focus of your faith in Christ because in Christ, it says you have perfect peace and confidence. And this is how I know that I'm in Christ when I have perfect peace and confidence. I know my focus has gone askew when I'm looking at everything else, Pam, and I start getting discouraged, troubled, and anxious. Don't try and change the world. What? What did he just say? I said, don't try and change the world. Let God change you and he will take care of the world. All right, Pam, we got time for one more question. That's really good. Um, Judy wrote in a question that's probably on everybody's mind right now. I work with a lot of people that are depressed and fearful because of the current world events. So how do I help others, believers and non-believers in this toxic environment? Judy, I really believe the answer is for us to go back to Jesus' words again in Matthew 5 verses. I'll take it from 13 and 14 and then land on 16. Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It's not good for anything any longer but to be thrown out and trodden underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. Judy, let me say it again. Sister, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. And verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your moral excellence and your praiseworthy, noble and good deeds and recognize and honor and praise and glorify your Father who is in heaven. You know, S. Truett Cathy, the founder of Chick-fil-A, said this. He said, we honor God in our success, not our failure. Let your light shine. 
Let your moral excellence shine with Christ on the inside of you. Jesus never said labor to change the world. Satan wants Christians unfocused and off track. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with everything and love your neighbor as yourself. But you can't love your neighbor as yourself until you're loving God with 100% of you. Humble yourself. Let God change you and therefore let God save the world. Be salt, be light, obey God and quit being sacrifice driven. It's a trap. Don't bite the bait, right? You got to get mentors and advisors in these areas. Pam, as we've been going through this, you know, an old adage has come up in my mind and it says this, great minds discuss ideas, average minds discuss events, and small minds discuss people. I think whoever invented that or came up with that probably was trying to discourage gossip. But listen to this. The truth is you are fearfully and wonderfully made, says Psalm 139, 14. You you're fearfully and wonderfully made, and therefore you have a great mind. But let's be honest, it's a canvas that needs to be intentionally painted. It's a genius computer, but it needs to be programmed. It's a mansion, but it needs to be intentionally furnished. And you, only you have the authority and dominion to choose what goes into your mind. That choice is yours and yours alone. Nobody can legislate that for you. You have to do it. Romans 12, 2 says this, Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind, God's word, proving what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Colossians 3, 2 says, Set your minds and keep them set on what is above, not on things that are on the earth. So how do we do this successfully? You got to use the H-E-L-P, right? You got to get some help. You got to be willing to give help, but you got to get help. We all need mentors and advisors. My friend, marriages need mentors and advisors. Small business leaders need mentors and advisors. Law enforcement needs mentors and advisors. Teenagers, we need mentors and advisors, right? Guitar players, drummers, singers need mentors and advisors. Single moms, you need mentors and advisors. They need H-E-L-P. Fathers need mentors and advisors. Why are you taking the hard path? Yes, somebody's let you down and hurt you, but a righteous man, a righteous woman, you know what the word says? Rises again and gets help. They give help. My friend, don't ever give up.